Hi folks, this time we're going to talk about Newton's second law, but we're going to talk about the equation, the mathematical equation that goes with Newton's second law. And that equation is F equals MA. This is one of those big important ideas you need to copy and, and put stars by. Make sure this goes on your formula sheet. Um, in this equation, F, capital F stands for force, which we in the metric system typically are going to use Newtons as a unit. M is mass in kilograms. A is acceleration in meters per second squared. Now, the unit, the Newton, actually gets its how much it is worth from the definition of F equals MA. Um, it is the mass in kilograms times acceleration units, meters per second squared, that equals one newton. So a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Um, this is not a defined unit. This is a derived unit, uh, which occurs when you have a combo pack of other units that are used so often that they are given their own name. When you're measuring things in Newtons, it's kind of convenient to think about how much weight or how much force is that. And that is about the weight of a small apple. That's about one Newton of force. Okay, grab your calculator, and we're going to play some calculator games, because I want you to get an idea of how, how big a Newton is. If you write down your weight in pounds, and I'm going to do a nice generic skinny person of 100 pounds, um, Take your pounds, multiply them by 0.45 to give you convert that into kilograms. So that's going to give you a mass of 45 kilograms. Now, force of gravity is weight. These two things are synonymous with each other. Um, so sometimes it is listed as F sub G for force of gravity, and sometimes you're going to see W sub T for weight. But they are exactly the same thing, and they are equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity, that 9.80 meters per second squared. So if you take your mass, multiply it times 9.8, and you do yours, I'm going to do this one, and that is going to give you your weight in newtons. So if you weigh 100 pounds, you're going to be about 441 newtons. If you weigh closer to 200 pounds, you're going to be 882 newtons. Um, a newton is a small unit, so they take a lot more of them to make up your weight. So just for giggles, let's find your mass in slugs. Slugs are an English unit, as you remember. And how we're going to do that is we're going to take your weight in pounds, so I'm going to use my nice generic 100-pound person, divided by the acceleration of gravity, not in metric, but in English. So if you have a weight of 100 pounds, you are going to have a mass of 3.11 slugs. And yeah, that is a nice little number. I like that number. Those are, those are good numbers. All right. We are going to, you are going to convert weight to mass and mass to weight all over the time, all over the place. That is just one of the things you do a lot in physics. As we start getting into problems, sometimes forces are not applied directly. Sometimes all pushes or pulls are not going to be straight one direction or straight the other. Often, they are going to be at an angle. Remember when we talked about breaking vectors into components? We only use the component of the force vector that is actually causing the acceleration. So if this is a child sitting on a sled or something like that, we have a happy little kid here, um, and somebody is pulling with 400 newtons of force at a 30 degree angle above the horizontal, what is the force causing the acceleration? Well, it's only going to be the component of the force in that direction. So we're going to drop a perpendicular, and it's only this component of the force that's going to accelerate forward. This is the adjacent side, so this is going to be force times the cosine of 30 degrees. And the force is 400 newtons times that cosine of 30 degrees. So the force causing acceleration let me hit my calculator here, times 400, I end up with the force forward of 346 newtons. 
Now, what if you are asked at what rate is this child accelerated? Well, if there is no friction, because we're on ice or something and we're going to ignore the small friction that's there, it is the net or unbalanced force that makes a mass accelerate. So the acceleration is going to be equal to the net force divided by the mass, or 346 newtons divided by the 80 kilograms, which is our child and the sled. And if I divide that out, I'm going to end up with an acceleration of 4.33. Now, how the heck do I get acceleration units out of that? Acceleration, as you know, should be meters per second squared. A newton is equivalent to, I'm going to do this up here, a newton is equivalent to a kilogram meter per second squared. We are dividing by kilograms, so you divide by a kilogram, that means you invert and multiply. So kilogram meters per second squared. We're going to flip over those kilograms, so 1 over kilograms. Kilograms canceled. I end up with meters per second squared, which actually is an acceleration unit. Ta-da! Life is fabulous. Before we start applying too much more math to F equals MA, I want to spend a few minutes proving to you or showing you that you understand an awful lot of this idea before we start applying lots of math. Let's take a look first off at talking about sporting equipment over the last 50 years. Now, I am so old, I still own a wooden tennis racket. Um, as you can tell, I don't play tennis very often. When I was a kid, I did quite a bit, and as my adult life, I just don't very much. Well, through the last 50 years, with the improvements in material science, with carbon fibers, with all these other wonderful composites that we have created, the mass of things like golf clubs, tennis rackets, skis, hockey sticks, automobiles, whatever, have gotten lighter and lighter and lighter. Well, as the mass of the sporting equipment gets lighter, the force when you are doing some sport, this is the force produced by the athlete. And you, once you get up to bat, once you actually start swinging your golf club, you are as in shape as you're going to be in the next moment. So the force is kind of set. But scientists have found that if we make the mass very, very small, we can make the acceleration big. And so people can have a tennis ball that flies further, a golf shot that goes further, um, skis that you can fly it more when you go over those, over those jumps. Hockey sticks are easier to swing. Because of this decrease in mass, they are easier to accelerate. Here's another example, an old facet fashion metal steel bicycle and the modern lightweight carbon fiber bicycles. I would guarantee you that my bicycle, this is not mine, but mine looks a lot like that as an old fashioned bicycle, it's going to weigh two or three times more than the light bicycles that are used by competitive cyclists today. Let's talk about cars and gas mileage. Maybe you're not into sports, but most people have gotten in a car somewhere in their life. Back in the 1970s, cars were made of Detroit iron. Now, I grew up in Detroit, and uh, I remember cars being these big, heavy behemoths that had lots and lots and lots of mass. But they also had huge, massive engines. And these were called muscle cars, and the muscle cars are these cars that just had big, huge engines, and the horsepower would be written right on the automobile. And I remember as a kid growing up, and there would be cars that had 300 horsepower or 400 horsepower. And these were big engines in order to accelerate the large mass of the vehicle and give it some sort of get up and go, which is acceleration. Well, about the 1980s, the late 70s, early 80s, what happened was there was an oil embargo in the Middle East. And during that time, gasoline prices went skyrocketing crazy. When I was a kid, gasoline was something crazy like 20 cents a gallon. Well, the gas prices just went up and up and up and up because we couldn't get gas from the Middle East. So the U.S. government put pressure on the Detroit auto manufacturers and said, you have to produce automobiles that get better mileage. Well, how do you get better mileage? Well, you can get better mileage by putting in a small little engine. 
small little engines, though, had a heck of a time accelerating big masses. And a lot of the cars that were produced back in the 1980s, not all of them, but many of them, were really gutless. They just did not have any horsepower. So it took a while for Detroit automakers to catch up with the Japanese automakers and from di different foreign countries. And what they found, if they want to have a small engine to have good gas mileage, they had to make the mass lighter. And that's why today a lot of the body panels are going to be made out of plastic. They're going to be made out of carbon. They're going to be made out of a lot of lightweight materials. And I remember the old guys in my family holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, sitting around going, darn cars today, they don't weigh nothing, and you can just put your foot th straight through them. They're so, so wimpy. I remember good old heavy Detroit iron. Well, yeah, and that's to save fuel economy. Less mass is easier to accelerate, so you don't need as big an engine. All right, next time we're going to go through some math examples with F equals MA.